Hi, and welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast, where we talk about images and the people who make them. I'm Roger Sakala, the founder of LensRentals.com. Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. This is Ryan Hill. I am here today with Joey Miller. Hello, how's it going? It's going well. And Roger Sakala. Good day. Uh, you may notice that we all sound a little different, and that is because we are not recording in the studio today. I have a mic in my home office. Uh, Joey, where are you? I'm in my office at work. And Roger is... I'm in my office at home. Undisclosed location. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, you know, please excuse any uh, audio quality differences here. We're doing what we can. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today, um, if you read our blog, you may have seen this. Roger wrote an article about how to disinfect camera equipment. And obviously, uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic, this is uh, something a lot of people, everybody should be thinking about. Uh, so we're going to kind of break that down in a little bit more detail and give you some tips on how to clean stuff without breaking stuff. And I want to start with our qualifications. Uh, just so you know, at least to a minimum, we're not throwing information out uh, willy-nilly here. Roger, do you want to run down your CV real quick? <laughs> no, but I used to be a physician uh, and in a contagious area in trauma critical care. So I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with all the disinfecting, sterilizing kind of things, although it's a little dated. And of course, uh, working at Lens Rentals, I know a lot about camera gear. Right. And Joey, you've been primarily handling the rollout of these policies in practice in the office, right? That's right. And and, and I'm dating a nurse. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're probably getting some good advice there. Maybe access to a mask. <laughs> I do have masks. Yes. Oh, good. Hey, Ryan, we've all got masks now. Yeah. Got- oh, nice. Yep. I've been using a bandana. I think uh, that's cooler. Yeah. Yeah, it certainly looks good. It's a uh it's merch I got from the podcast Judge John Hodgman. It's a podcast oh, merch bandana. Nice. nice. It has a hot dog on it. I've got the uh Memphis uh Aquifer Sands bandana. Nice. So don't worry about us folks. We've got cool bandanas. <laughs> uh to be clear, before we get into any actual advice, what we're talking about here is not medical advice and it's not generally meant to be a definitive statement on how coronavirus should be handled broadly. It's just meant to be advice on how to clean your equipment without messing it up. I should also note here that we're recording this on Tuesday, uh, April 7th. You're going to be hearing this on Thursday, April 9th. So we're putting as little space in between recording and release as we can to make sure that we're referencing up-to-date information. But things change quickly. And especially if you're listening to this after the release date, there may be some different things happening uh, than we're referencing here. And I think we'll try as we go. We may not be perfect at it to say, this is what we think. This is what we know. This is kind of a guess to give you an idea of how comfortable we are with some of the things we talk about. Yeah, we'll be as we'll be as clear as we possibly can. And I want to start with the first step I guess anybody should take before cleaning any gear, before trying to disinfect their work area, washing your hands. And Roger, I was wondering if you could give me a little bit more scientific explanation about why soap and water is so effective when other even cleaning products don't seem to be entirely. Yeah, it's, it's pretty straightforward. This virus has a lipid or fatty capsule around it, and it needs that to keep everything in place. Um, if you've ever like put a greasy pan in a dish in the, the sink, and you see the little droplets of oil float up, as soon as you put soap in the water, the soap dissolves that oil or mixes it with water so that it uh, dissolves. And that's the whole purpose of the soap in the hand washing. It takes the fatty capsule of the virus and dissolves it, and the virus is no longer able to uh, infect you once that's done. So that's the most effective thing we have for this virus is getting something to take the fatty capsule, dissolve it, and the virus is basically no longer infectious. How often should people be washing their hands? Is this like every time you touch basically anything? In theory, yes. 
I touched it. I washed my hands. That's not practical, but I think it's pretty easy to set up your your hand washing cycle. For example, let's say you're at the office, you're working on your computer for a while and blah, 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 blah. When you get up, wash your hands. You go eat lunch. When you finish, wash your hands. Uh, I'm washing mine, I would guess probably 12, 15 times a day. Easy, probably more like 20. Something I've seen in food service especially is sort of gloves as a replacement for hand washing. (laughs) Uh, And I, I, I believe this is the case. I'd like confirmation but you should be either throwing away gloves whenever you would wash your hands or washing your gloves, right? Yes. And uh, here goes the next three hours of the podcast when we talk about gloves. But <laughs> you know, basically, the best way to use a glove is the way like we would do it in the hospital. A pair of gloves is for a task, and then you put them away. So you go into surgery, you put on gloves, you finish surgery, you don't go to the next patient. You take off your gloves. For people in practical things, uh, for example, like some of the people at Lens Rentals, they may be doing something they feel is high risks, let's say opening all the boxes. So you put on gloves, open all the boxes, then either throw away your gloves or as a secondary thing, go wash your hands. Yeah, I'm glad to see people in the food service industry wearing gloves. It's not protecting me because they've touched 47,000 things, but it probably is protecting them if before they do anything else, they take their gloves off. So it's it's not a, oh, I've got gloves on, I don't have to worry because after you've touched one thing, your gloves are as dirty as your hands were before you put them on. The one thing I will say is it's kind of amusing to me is I want somebody who doesn't know how to take off gloves. And what they did was they'd been wearing their gloves and they took the glove off their left hand and then using their left hand, they took their glove off their right hand, which had been, you know, in theory, all contaminated. When you take off gloves, the right way to do it is with each hand, you grasp the wrist of the other hand in your fingers, and then you pull your arms apart, and the gloves come off inside out, and you drop them in a trash can. You've never touched the outside of them. Oh, I've never even considered that. Yeah, I learned this the really hard way um, as a cook in a kitchen. Once a week at this restaurant down in Oxford, I used to have to stem and seed a bunch of ha- ha- habanero peppers for a jerk sauce we used to make. And I would always wear gloves. And the very first time I ever did this, my right thumb went under the glove, under the cuff of the glove, and like just barely grazed my wrists. Uh, and the same thing happened when I went to grab the left side. Within about 10 minutes or so, my wrists were on fire and it started, to, it spread. I, I tried to wash and it just spread everything. I ended up like dunking my forearms in ice water for a good half hour because I just, I couldn't take it. Uh, we should we should teach the the nurses and doctors uh, use this technique to show them how to take gloves off when they're like it's highly effective. Highly yeah, I bet effective. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move into disinfectants. Uh, I know, especially hand sanitizer, isopropyl alcohol is maybe difficult to find for people right now. So the blog article we're referencing covers a lot of different things that can be used as disinfectants. But I do want to start with isopropyl alcohol. This is found mainly in hand sanitizer. Is that right? It's in hand sanitizer wipes uh, or bottles. Um, when we wrote the blog post, it was almost impossible to find it. It's getting better now. But uh, you can take a bottle of isopropyl alcohol and pour it in a spray bottle, and you've got a great spray disinfectant. Okay. And isopropyl alcohol is typically mixed in hand sanitizer with... Some lotiony things, Yeah. Gel- gelatins or lotions and everything else. The, the key is with the alcohol, you have to have 60%. So if you have some 98% alcohol and you dilute it a little bit, you're fine. Um, one of the things I've, I've seen a couple of uh, people doing is they're taking hand sanitizer and adding a little aloe vera to it because it helps their hands. I understand it does. But if it was 60% alcohol and then you put aloe vera in it, it's now less than 60% alcohol. And why is that 60% number, like, why, why is that the line? Uh, that's the line where it's been shown to be effective against the virus. You know, it, it, could, uh-huh. it could be 55 is effective. It could be that 65 is a little better, but it's at that range. But uh, kind of the same thing as, as we talked about with soap, alcohol dissolves fats. So again, if you put a drop of that fatty, greasy stuff in water, it makes a little bubble. But if you put it in alcohol, it doesn't, it dissolves. This is something I learned from reading the blog article that I didn't realize, and it makes a ton of sense in retrospect. If you're using hand sanitizer or really using isopropyl alcohol on any surface, you should be letting it 
dry rather than wiping it off. Is that right? Yeah, basically. It's the same as, you know, they tell you it takes 20 seconds of washing your hands with soap and water to kill a virus. Uh, it takes some time. It's not like, oh, I touched it and it died. And the simple thing with alcohol, it dissolves pretty, it evaporates pretty quickly is, you know, let it evaporate and it's been there long enough. Now, another alternative, if people maybe don't have uh, alcohol wipes available, is bleach and probably easier to find maybe these days than like alcohol wipes. Oh, I think um, it is. I've, n- I've never seen the bleach out at the grocery store. I mean, it's pretty cheap, yeah. especially since you dilute it. Um, and we should cover that. You should always dilute bleach. Is that right? Absolutely. Um, maybe an ounce in a quart. Yeah, unless you're doing some sort of heavy duty cleaning. Yeah. Cleaning. But you should only dilute with water. Only dilute with water and in a clean container. Okay. Because it can it can like react with just about any other cleaning product. <laughs> and none of it's good. Uh, in, vi- in in bad yeah. ways, yes. <laughs> uh bleach and ammonia, bleach and vinegar, bleach and well, with most of the bleach and anything products, you're going to get a lot of fumes and they're toxic. Bleach is chlorine. And if you ever read like World War I history, they use chlorine gas as one of the gases that they would uh, kill each other with. So it's, it's potent stuff. If you inhale much of it, uh, I actually did this long. I was very young and I moved into some shitty apartment and cleaned the nasty bathroom with a ton of bleach. And I spent about three days unable to breathe. <laughs> I mean, it, no. it's just, you, you, this is toxic stuff. So, you're going around trying to kill the coronavirus, and if you do it with something that makes you have a hard time breathing, you're going to be nervous. But but for all the bad talk about it, the dilute bleach, okay, you've got your ounce of bleach in your quart of water. That's probably the best general sterilizer you can get. It kills about everything. So that's probably, if you're going to put something in like a spray bottle, that's probably your best bet. Just Bleach or alcohol, you have to be aware with even dilute bleach. You can, you know, fade that pretty rug or something if you spray it on it. But uh, Also worth noting, uh, a dilution of bleach doesn't last more than like a day. So once you make a bottle, you're going to have to dump it out and make a new bottle. That's a good point. At the yeah. next day. Oh, I didn't know that. Uh, bleach, even concentrated, will lose its potency over time. Like after a year, it's like 70% effective or something like that. Somebody can look up these numbers. Um, whereas I don't think isopropyl alcohol has that same issue. I tell you where I'm using it now is we have a bottle of bleach in my house. Uh, my significant other's a nurse. So we're kind of in home quarantine. She lives at one end of the house. I live at the other. She's in the ICU. So we have a bottle of bleach and we go through the house and spray door handles. I think for those kind of purposes on items that are not going to fade and uh, be particularly toxic, bleach is great and cheap and available. I mix up a small uh, spray bottle of bleach every day and I spray all my doors, doorknobs and buttons going in and out of my apartment building. Uh, You mentioned oxidizing agents. Um, That I think is generally presented as like a cloth safe alternative to bleach. We're talking about uh, OxyClean, I think is probably the most common. Hydrogen peroxide falls in that class too. But all the Safe bleaches basically are oxidizing agents. Hydrogen peroxide is an oxidizing agent. What are some use cases for that where you might be able to use an oxidizing agent like OxyClean or hydrogen peroxide where you wouldn't be able to use bleach? I think the big thing is is chemically it's gentler. Okay. And probably generally safer for like dyed cloth. Yeah. Or, or if say a, a camera bag, I wouldn't mind wiping, wiping that down with an oxidizing agent. I'd be a little leery about turning my black bag gray with some bleach maybe. Although we might ought to touch on quaternary ammoniums first because they're effective. The quaternary ammoniums uh, are really weird and everybody asks me like, what chemicals? There's about 700 chemicals. But uh, things like disinfectant wipes and MediClean and Fantastic Spray and even dryer sheets and fabric softener are all quaternary ammonium compounds. And they're, again, kind of like the uh, oxidizing agents. They're probably effective. There's a little argument about it. The CDC says they're effective and we know it's the government, so it must be correct. But I don't think it's quite as clear, yet they're still a good product, and I wouldn't hesitate to use those. They're really safe. So I think Clorox disinfecting wipes uh, are that. And uh, the, the dryer sheets are kind of a cool thing. They're, those those dryer sheets are all quaternary ammonium compounds, and it's the kind of thing you can put in a pocket or purse. They're dry. Add a little water, and you've got a good disinfectant. 
Yeah, the use case you mentioned in the blog article I really liked that uh, you could just keep a few in your pocket to use if you like have to touch a doorknob that you don't know has been disinfected. Exactly. And getting into spaces. So uh, one of the primary uh, worries we have at Lens Rentals is that everybody is sort of working in uh, one big room. It's a it's an open floor. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. It's very modern. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, one of our, our, our primary concerns is keeping people six feet away from each other. I'm sure listeners have heard that stat. It, you should be six feet away from another person at any time. Why six feet? Why six feet in particular? Oh, because that's about two cubits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you're on your way to an art. Yeah, I mean, really, there's no, this six feet thing is, is not like a magic thing. If you mm-hmm. sneeze or cough, the loogies will all fall by six feet. That's the scientific way I can say that. Um, if you're talking, the cloud of particles you put out tends to stay somewhat within six feet. Notice the somewhat and should and kind of, it's not clear. If you got eight, eight's better. If you got four, that's worse. There's no magic six foot number. I'm six feet away, I'm safe. And, you know, further is better, but six feet should allow most of the droplets that leave your mouth to fall to the ground. Now, all that being said, masks help all the stuff that leaves your mouth and nose not go so far. You still breathe it out unless you're wearing, you know, N99 masks, not preventing everything from leaving. But a couple of things happen. One, the bigger particles get caught in the mask and a lot of the smaller ones do too. Second is there's less momentum. So if I breathe hard through a mask, those particles are slowed down by the mask quite a bit. They're not going to travel as far. Yeah. Wearing a mask is about other people, not about yourself. But if you're all wearing masks, then you're all doing it. That's exactly sex. right. You know, it's like a, it's like a big group face. Hug. Kinda. Yeah. That's <laughs> nice. And I think the other part of this is, you know, everybody wants an absolute. If I do this, I'm totally protected. Well, there are no absolutes, but every little thing helps. So all the disinfecting we talked about wearing masks, keeping distance, all of that is beneficial. And, um, you know, everything you can do is helpful and everything you can do slows. It. Well, I think on that note, we'll take a quick break. When we get back, I want to get into more specifics on how to clean your gear in particular, rather than like surfaces and areas and what uh, isn't going to mess up your lenses. Break, 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 break. Now, Lens Rentals brings you a meditation moment. Close your eyes. Lean back and listen to my voice. You feel yourself getting sleepy. Relax. Drifting on a cloud. You love this podcast. You want to give this podcast a five-star rating. You want to write a positive review of it and even subscribe to it. You know that will bring you a feeling of joy and contentment. When I count to three, you will wake up refreshed and go straight to the review page. One, two, three. Welcome back to the Linternals Podcast. We are talking about safe, effective ways to clean your gear sanitize it, and hopefully be as careful as you can during all of this. Uh, I want to start with, and this is general consensus, not scientific fact, how long your gear needs to sit untouched away from another person for it to be generally safe to pick back up again. There's a whole lot of argument that's going around. Certainly 24 hours is probably the minimum. There's some good evidence that on certain substances, 72 hours is necessary. And I want to put a divider here because everybody has jumped all over the place about they found something after 18 days and they found something after 17 days. I don't know that they didn't, but it wasn't a controlled study. And in the labs, nobody's getting it much over 72 hours. There's been one or two, if the conditions are ideal, five days. If you've got it put away for 24 hours, it's probably safe. 
Uh, 72 hours, almost certainly safe. There, there are arguments it could be longer. And like we talked about earlier, it may be in May, they go, see, you were wrong. It was seven days. It could be. Um, but I'm not worried about things that have been left alone for 24 hours. Okay. Yeah. And I, I guess this is probably a good point to get into like our logistical workflow in terms of how we handle gear throughout the building. Can you give a rundown, Joey, of sort of where everything goes from receiving to gathering cage and then when and how it's shipped? Right. So currently what happens is the boxes come in, all the gear is removed from the uh, the hard cases we keep everything in, and then it's moved to a secondary location where a team is cleaning everything with e-cover before it goes to our uninspected area. Uh, once it goes to the uninspected area, it's gathered, brought to our, our techs that are testing everything. They test it, make sure it's working. Then it gets sent into our inspected cage where it typically sits. Uh, some things will sit in there for a long time, um, hot items may turn around the same Not day. Not more. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You were a little slower. Yeah. If you were looking to rent some some pretty hard to find items, now is the time mm-hmm. because they're not hard to find anymore. It's looking pretty good. Uh, we got tons of them and they're sitting here nice and safe for you. So, But yeah, uh, under, under normal circumstances, there are some items. Uh, that go right out. Typically, yeah, things that we turn around like 24 to 70s, 70 to 200s, and anything that's short stock that needs to be received and shipped on the same day will sometimes not go into that cage for very long. But most of our gear, even under normal circumstances, is sitting in that area waiting to be ordered for, on average, I would say probably three, five days. Right. And then once it is ordered, it goes again through another cleaning crew uh, before it's boxed up and shipped out. Uh, and you know, most of our standard shipping is two days, so it's sitting in a box for two days. So it's, everything is getting to people clean as clean as, as anything else, uh, would be so. Right. And, you know, not to turn this into a Lynn journals ad, this is also a workflow you can sort of utilize if you're, if you're working with gear, probably the safest thing you can do is disinfect it after it's used, put it somewhere don't touch it for as long as you can. And that somewhere ideally should be away from like regular movement of people Mm -hmm. and then disinfect it again after it's sat away untouched before using it. And wash your hands between all of these. Yes. Um, What do we use in house, Joey? You mentioned that e-clean. Are there any other products that are sort of go-tos for us when we're cleaning our gear? We use a Purisol marine cleaner on a lot of things. And that doesn't have any disinfectant properties, really. It's just like a glass cleaner. Yeah, it's just to make things look nice. Um, Tons of isopropyl. And this came up in the blog comments. A lot of manufacturers don't recommend isopropyl alcohol. Why is that? Well, at 99%, it can do some things. I think mostly of concern is LCD, so some of the LEDs and LCDs, the covers will fade. The other thing is, it's interesting because I'm not going to name names, but some of the manufacturers who said, well, we don't recommend you use isopropyl. Their techs use isopropyl in their repair department all day long. Every repair shop I know uses 60% isopropyl. Any chemical, and isopropyl is a chemical and so is water, you know, too much is going to cause some issues sometimes. Um, I am not sure what the manufacturers are trying to say. And my guess is some of that was, well, just say no, because otherwise they're going to say we said it was safe and somebody's going to break something. So I, I can't say that I've ever seen an item in our hands. Now, one thing I will say, our stuff is less than two years old as a rule, but we've never seen anything that seemed to have any fading damage or anything else from isopropyl alcohol. We're judicious in our use of it, I think, Joey, wouldn't you say? I mean, we don't tend to soak everything. No, we're not soaking everything, but I mean, we're not going easy on yeah, it. Yeah, so. swabs and cloths and whatever. But LCDs and viewfinders would be the one thing that I'd be a little le- leery of and maybe be light with that. And the catch-22 is the LCD and the viewfinder is the thing that's up by your face the most. So, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes it's just common sense, but, you know, my camera's mine. No one else touches it. I'm glad you mentioned sort of cotton swabs and cloths because I, I want to get into uh, not just like what to use al- isopropyl alcohol for, but uh, how. So we're not 
we're not typically just taking a spray bottle and spraying down lenses, right? You're usually applying it with some sort of cloth or cotton swab. Yeah. Yeah. Usually a clean cloth. Cotton swabs less so, unless you're really just trying to get into some Nooks uh, and crannies. hard to reach places. And are there any circumstances in which people doing this themselves at home should be worried about internal liquid damage? And if as long as you're spraying and not like dunking things, uh, fine mist is going to be fine. Like uh, especially with any kind of like L series lenses and stuff, they're, they're sealed well enough that mist isn't going to really matter. I, I agree with that. I, you know, you, you can get a little moisture into a lens or a camera, but again, I would be a little hesitant to really, if you're aggressively soaking a lens, let's say, putting it right back on the camera and putting electricity through it. Uh, I, I tend to give it that time to dry in a couple of minutes, but otherwise I can't see a problem. And in terms of lights, um, I know isopropyl alcohol, I believe, is safe as long as you're not using like a hand sanitizer with aloe. Right. Uh, but generally, you should not be using anything that can leave behind any residue. Uh, so essentially just alcohol and water is the best thing for lights. Uh, and why is that? Who wants to cover that? That's a fun one. <laughs> Joey? <laughs> yeah, I have seen this happen yeah. on in amateur indie film sets, and it's scary. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think especially when, when you've got that. tungsten lights. If you leave residue on a tungsten bulb and it gets hot, it explodes, and that's bad. Yes. So the bulbs in these lights, LEDs are kind of an exception because they don't get nearly as hot as traditional bulbs like a tungsten or an HMI. Um, But essentially any light bulb other than an LED, you should avoid touching it because your uh, fingers or any cleaning products that have oils uh, or really any residue can get left behind, heat up on the bulb and then cause the bulb to explode. Uh, so and violent yeah. yes not just yes not crack not just cause the light to go out like explode and send glass flying so it's very like important scare to scare the shit out of you explode yes <laughs> that, <laughs> very loud and very scary that uh, that being said in most cases there is a cover whether it's a, a parental lens or or something that you can clean that's not the bulb right yeah and there's probably no circumstance in which you really need to clean a bulb it's just when you're changing bulbs probably don't touch it with ungloved hands <laughs> you know we're talking about these things get so hot they'll explode that should cover disinfection just fine turn it on for a second boom you're clean right yeah that's a good <laughs> point yeah you don't need to be disinfecting your light bulbs uh let's get into cameras because that's probably the iffiest thing in it well anything with electronics but the a camera is probably the most electronically complex thing people are going to be cleaning regularly do we take any different steps than we do with lenses joey uh i mean they're just a little more meticulous because there's a lot more crevices to get into and that's that's the main thing it's also the thing that's closest to the user's face yeah yeah so uh, extra care to make sure that the eye cup is clean or the viewfinder is clean the lcd is clean where it's going to come in closer contact to your face and there's probably not an issue with alcohol damaging LCD screens, at least not with like reasonable use. Sixty percent, I think I'm very comfortable with. I, I, there's some stuff about ninety nine percent that may may or may not be real. I've never seen it, but it doesn't mean it's not there. And what are some things I know you mentioned batteries and media in the blog article, and I think that's an important point. There are small accessories that people may not be considering here, and and they tend to hand them around a lot. If you get a shoots and it's like, give me a battery, I need another media card, I need this, I need that. Uh, so they're touched a lot, and I think that's the main reason. Yeah, just think about everything you touch all the time. On that note, what is the best way to disinfect a strap? Like any other cloth, it's to wash it. Okay, so you can run it through like a washer without yeah, any trouble? If, if there's a leather part to it, that may be a problem in the washer. But the ones that are all cloth also throw in their you know, backdrops, uh, probably most bags. Uh, the washing machine disinfects. And we talked about earlier the chemicals. Well, we got detergent, we got fabric softener, maybe some bleach. All those things disinfect and it comes out of the dryer. It's fine. Just, you know, wipe down the washer and dryer lids if you're using, you know, the ones in your building. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Good point. <laughs> and the handles. Yeah. Laundry's been a nightmare. Oh, yeah. I didn't think about it's that. Great. That's true. <laughs> oh, but yeah, I, I, that's, that's talk about that place. I'd go in with my little spray bottle of bleach and bleach all the handles and controls first. That would be my first step. 
Well, anything else? Anything, any safety tips people should be keeping in mind? I'm just going to reiterate this again. Wash your hands. Yes, 100%. (laughs) That bears repeating. Wash your hands. But I have a financial tip because like every other crisis, the scammers are out in force. They're selling stuff they don't have to sell you at prices you shouldn't pay. And whether that's the little ads for here's the one man who survived the family gathering of 29 because he had our mask on. Right as we speak, I have 7,200 spams telling me I can have N95 masks tomorrow. And guess what, people? I can't. But the big one I want to touch on is UV light. It's a pertinent thing to talk about because UV light does kill a lot of bacteria. But I've had four, count them, four friends now who've paid over $100 for a UV light that I can get for about $1.95. Uh, because they're sold in bulk in China. They have no idea what the wavelength of said light is, nor the power of said light, nor do they have any idea of how much UV light is required to actually disinfect anything. And they're buying these tiny little, not powerful handheld lights that we don't know if they even work on the virus. And if we do, we don't know how much. So if you don't know what you're buying and you don't know the power and you don't know how much power it takes to kill a virus, you're probably getting scammed. You know, but generally, probably better best to just stick with the basic stuff that works for everything else. The right. kind of things we're mentioning here, isopropyl alcohol, bleach. Yeah, you know, I think some of these things are just common sense. Well, I think that'll about do it. Thank you both for coming on. I hope I'll, I'll see you in person in not too, too long. I'm hoping maybe three weeks or so we'll start actually, you know, seeing each other again from a distance safely with our masks on. Yeah, we'll see. Hi, listeners. It's Ryan again. I wanted to let you know that we're going to be taking a little late spring break. We won't be putting out any full episodes for a bit, but stay subscribed because we're going to be recording some bonus episodes during the break and we'll be back with a whole new season of full episodes in the summer. Thanks again for listening and stay tuned. 